You Forever by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa Read to you by Blue Friend September 2016 Lesson 16 So we meet again in our attic. We have cleaned up the place a bit and discovered a few fresh items. Some of them will perhaps shine a little ray of light onto a doubt which you've had for some time. Look at this for a start. Here is a letter which we received some time ago. It says, You write about fear. You say there is nothing to be afraid of except fear. In your answer to my question, you told me that it was fear that was keeping me back, preventing me from progressing. I am not conscious of fear. I do not feel afraid. So what can the matter be? Yes, that is quite an interesting problem. Fear. Fear is the only thing that can hold a person back. Shall we have a look at it? Sit down for a moment and let's discuss this problem of fear. All of us have certain fears. Some people are afraid of the dark. Others are afraid of spiders or snakes. And some of us may be aware of our fears. That is, we have fears which are in our consciousness. But wait a moment. Our consciousness is only a tenth of us. Nine-tenths of us are subconscious. So what happens if the fear is in our subconscious? Often we will do things under hidden compulsion, or we will refrain from doing something because of a hidden compulsion. We do not know why we do a certain thing. We do not know why we cannot do a certain thing. There is nothing on the surface. There is nothing that we can pin down. We act irrationally, and if we went to a psychologist and we lay on that couch for long, long hours, at last it may be dragged out of our subconscious that we had a fear because of something that happened when we were small babies. The fear would be hidden, hidden from our awareness, working at us, nagging at us from our subconscious. It would be like termites attacking a wooden frame building. The building, to all cursory inspections, would appear to be sound, flawless, and then, almost overnight, it would collapse under the influence of those termites. The same thing happens in the matter of fear. Fear does not have to be conscious to be active. It is most active when it is subconscious, because then we do not know that it is there, and, not knowing that it is there, there is nothing we can do about it. Throughout the lifetime of all of us, we have been subjected to certain conditioning influences. A person who has been brought up as a Christian will have been taught that certain things are not done. Certain things are distinctly forbidden. Yet, people of a different religion, brought up differently, are permitted to do such things. So, in looking into the question of fear, we have to examine what has been our racial and family background. Are you afraid of seeing a ghost? Why? If Aunt Matilda was kind-hearted and generous and, and loved you dearly during her lifetime, there is no reason whatever to suppose that she's going to love you less when she has left this life and gone on to a far better stage of existence. So why fear the ghost of Aunt Matilda? We fear the ghost because it is something alien to many of us. We fear a ghost because it may have been taught in our religion that there are no such things, that one cannot see a ghost unless one is a saint or an associate of saints or something. We fear that which we do not understand, and it is worth thought that if there were no passports, no language difficulties, there would be less wars because we are afraid of the Russians or the Turks or the Afghanis or something else, because we do not understand them. 
We do not know what makes them tick or what they are going to do against us. Fear is a terrible thing. It is a disease. It is a scourge. It is a thing that corrodes our intellect. If we have certain reservations about a thing, then we must dig down and find out why. For instance, why do certain religions teach that there is no such thing as reincarnation? One obvious example is this. In the days of long ago, the priests had utter power, and they ruled people by terror, by the thought of eternal damnation. Everyone was taught that they had to make the best of this life because there would be no other opportunity. It was known that if people were taught of reincarnation, they might tend to slack in this life and pay for it in the next. In connection with this, it used to be perfectly permissible in the China of long ago to contract a debt in this life to be paid in the next. It is also worth remarking that China became decadent because the people believed so much in reincarnation that they didn't bother much in this life. Instead, they just sat around, taking their canaries out in cages under the trees at night and deciding that they would make up for it in the next life. This one would be more or less a vacation. Well, it didn't work that way, and so the whole Chinese culture became decadent. Once again, examine yourself, your intellect, your imagination. Give yourself deep analysis and find out what it is that your subconscious is trying to bottle up. What it is that is making you so afraid, so worried, so jittery about things. When you dig that out, you will find that there are no more fears. It is fear which stops people from doing astral traveling. Actually, as we well know, astral traveling is remarkably simple. There is no effort to it. It is as simple as breathing, and yet, most people fear it. Sleep is almost death. Sleep is a reminder of death, a reminder that eventually we shall go off into a deep sleep, and we wonder what will happen to us when death, instead of sleep, claims us. We wonder if, during our sleep, someone will sever our silver cord and we will be off. That cannot happen. There is no danger in astral traveling. There is only danger in fear. In fear that you know, and more danger in fear that you do not know. We suggest again and again Get down to this problem of fear. That which you know and understand is not fearsome. So get to know and understand what it is that you now fear. We devoted a lot of time to that little incident, did we not? We must move on, for there is much yet to engage our attention, much yet to be dealt with before we can draw the curtains on this lesson and move on to the next. Look about you. Look about in our attic. Does anything in particular attract your attention? Do you see that ornament over there? Out of this world, isn't it? Oh! We may have started something with that saying. Out of this world, there are many sayings in common use which are truly descriptive of things. A man might say that he has seen something so beautiful that it was right out of this world. How true that is. When we get beyond the confines of this carbon molecule existence, with all its pains and trials and tribulations, we can hear sounds and see colors and have experiences which are, quite literally, out of this world. Here are we, confined in the cave of our own ignorance. We are confined by the bonds of our own lusts, our own wrong thoughts. 
So many of us are so busy trying to keep up with the Joneses that we have no time to look about us. We have the mundane whirl of existence. We have to earn our living, and then there are social obligations. After that, we have a certain amount of sleep, so it seems that all our life is planned in one whirl, one mad rush. There is never time for anything. But wait a minute. Is there any need for all this rush? Can we not arrange somehow to have even as little as half an hour each day and devote it to meditation? If we will meditate, we can get right out of this world. We can, with a little practice, get into the astral and into the next world. The experience is exhilarating, elevating. When we elevate our spiritual thinking, we increase our rate of vibration. And the higher we can perceive on our piano scale, do you remember that scale? the more beautiful the experiences which we may undergo. Out of this world should be our objective, of course. We want to get out of this world when we have learned our lessons, but not before. Look again at our classroom experiences. Many of us may have been heartily sick of staying in a stuffy classroom on a warm summer's day, listening to the droning voice of a teacher churning up stuff which really had no interest for us. Who wanted to know about the rise and fall of a certain empire? We felt we should be much better off out in the open, we desired, above all, to get away from that classroom, that hot and stuffy room with the dull voice droning on. But we could not do so. If we had just run out, there sure would have been retribution from the teachers. If we had skipped our lessons, we should have failed our exams, and instead of passing on to another grade, we should have been kept back in the same monotonous classroom with another lot of students that would have looked upon us as curiosities and dunces because we had failed to make the grade. Let us not, then get out of this world permanently until we have learned that which we came to learn. We can look forward confidently to joys, to ease, and to spiritual perfection when we leave this world for that which is much more glorious. We should always keep in mind that we are here as one serving a prison sentence under particularly doleful conditions. We cannot see how dreadful this earth is while we are here, but if you could move out now and look down, you would have quite a shock. You would be most unwilling to return. That is why so many of us cannot do astral traveling, because, unless one is prepared, it is indeed an unpleasant experience to return. All the joy is the other side. Those of us who do astral traveling look forward to the days of our release, but we also make sure that while we are in our prison cell, we behave as best we can, for if we do not behave, we lose our remission time. So, let us do the best we can upon earth so that when we come to pass from this life we are prepared and ready for the greater things of the life beyond. It is worth the small effort involved in living here. We seem to be very busy in our attic, shifting items, knocking the dust off some which have been sorted for a long time, but let us move on to the other side of the room. Let us look at another little item. Many people think that seers are always looking at one's aura, always reading one's thoughts. How wrong they are! 
A person with telepathic ability, or the power of clairvoyance, is not always reading thoughts or examining the aura of friends or enemies. Some of the things we should see would be far too unpleasant, far too unflattering. Some of them would indeed burst the balloon of our imagined importance. There is too much else to do. We have in mind a certain person who sometimes visits us. She will start off a sentence and utter three or four words and then trail off with, But I don't have to tell you anything, do I? You know everything just by looking at me, don't you? That is not so. We could know everything, but it would be morally wrong to do so. Have no fear about seers, occultists, clairvoyants, and others, for if they are of good morals, they will not be peering at your private affairs, even with your invitation. If they are not of good morals, they cannot do it anyway. We want to tell you here that the backstreet seer who tells your fortune for a trifle has no real seeing ability. She's usually a poor old woman who cannot make money in any other way. Probably, at some time, she had clairvoyant ability, but you cannot do such things on a commercial basis. You cannot tell a person clairvoyantly things about themselves for money, because the mere fact of passing of money causes the telepathic ability to wane, and the backstreet seer cannot always see. Yet, if she has taken money, then she must put on some sort of a show. Being quite a good, untrained psychologist, she will let you do the talking and will then tell you the things that you told her. And you, being deluded by the term seer, will exclaim with wonder at how accurately she has told you what you want to know. Have no fear that clairvoyants are looking at your affairs. Would you be happy if you thought that you were busy in your own home, writing a letter, maybe, and someone came into your room peered over your shoulder and read what you were writing? Would you like that person to go through your possessions, picking up this and that, and reading that, and getting to know all about you, getting to know all that you had, all that you thought about? Would you like to think that a person was tuning in all the time to any telephone conversation that you had? Of course you wouldn't. Let us say once again that a person of good character does not read your thoughts all the time, and a person of bad character quite definitely doesn't have the ability. That is a law of the occult. A person of bad character is not clairvoyant. You might hear a lot of tales about a person who sees this and that and something else. Discount 999% of it. A clairvoyant will always wait for you to tell him or her what you want to discuss. The clairvoyant will not intrude into the privacy of your thoughts or your aura, not even if you invite that clairvoyant to do so. There are certain laws of occultism which must be adhered to most rigidly, for if one breaks those laws, one can be punished in much the same way as one can be punished if one breaks a man-made law on earth. Tell the clairvoyant what you want to tell. He or she will know if you are telling the truth. We will go so far as to admit that. Tell the clairvoyant whatever you want to, but make sure that if you do, you tell the truth. Otherwise, you are deluding yourself only, and not in any way deluding the clairvoyant. So, remember once again, a good psychic or seer will not read your thoughts, and a bad one cannot. Now, here is another little item which we'll take a look at. 
it is this. So, you don't get on with your marriage partner? Well, that may be the obstacle which you have to overcome on earth. Let us put it this way. Horses are entered in races, and if one horse wins consistently, and apparently has no great effort in so doing, that horse is handicapped. You can look upon yourself as a horse. You may have gone too quickly, too easily through your last lessons. In that case, you may be handicapped with a partner who is not suitable for you. Make the best of it while you can, remembering that if your partner is really incompatible with you, then you will never, never come into contact with him or her in the life beyond this earth. If a man picks up a screwdriver or a hammer that is just a tool which suits the need of a job at hand, the partner can be looked upon as a tool which enables one to do a certain job, to learn a certain lesson. A man may become attached to a screwdriver or a hammer, may become attached to it because it enables him to do a job that he has to do, but you may be sure that a man will not be so attached to his hammer or screwdriver that he will want to take it with him to the other side. There is so much said and written about the glory of humanity, but we are going to say that humans are not the greatest form of life. Humans on earth, for example, are truly a scruffy lot, sadistic, selfish, and self-seeking. If they were not, they would not be upon this earth because people come to this earth in order that they may learn how to overcome just those things. Humans are greater indeed when they get beyond life, but let us again make sure that we understand that if we have an unsuitable marriage partner here, or unsuitable parents, it may be because we planned that as something which we would have to overcome. A person may have a vaccination or inoculation. They may, for instance, deliberately take a dose of smallpox by way of inoculation in order that they may be protected from a more severe and perhaps fatal dose later on. So it is that our marriage partner or our parents may have been chosen in order that we could learn certain lessons from associating with them. But we do not have to meet them again after we have finished this life. In fact, we cannot meet them if they are incompatible with us. For, we must repeat, when we are on the other side of death, we are living in harmony, and if people are not in harmony with us, they cannot associate with us. Many of us can indeed take comfort from that. But the shadows of night are closing in. The day is coming to an end. We feel that we should not detain you any longer, for you will have much to do before the night falls. Let us leave the attic and close the door gently behind us. Close the door upon all the treasures contained therein, and let us descend those aged creaking stairs again, and go our separate ways in peace. End of Lesson 16 You Forever by Tuesday Lobsang Rampa Read to you by Blue Friend September 2016 uh, This is Lesson 17 Have you ever had a person walk up to you bubbling with excitement and then, almost grasping your jacket, burst out, Oh my dear, I had a most 
terrible experience last night. I dreamed that I was walking down the street without a single stitch of clothing on, and I was most embarrassed. This has happened in various forms and various versions to many people. One may have had a dream in which one was suddenly transported to a drawing room full of elegantly dressed people and then discovered that one has omitted to put one's clothing on. Or you may have had a dream yourself in which you found yourself standing on some street corner, again either in some outlandish garb or without any garb whatsoever. That can be, you know, that can have been an actual astral experience. Those of us who can see people doing astral traveling have some amazing and amusing encounters. But this course is not a discourse on witticisms, but instead it is designed to help you on what is, after all, a perfectly normal occurrence. Let us devote this particular lesson to dreams, because dreams in one form or another happen to anybody, to everybody. From time immemorial, dreams have been looked upon as omens or signs or portents, and there are even those who purport to tell fortunes by one's dreams. Others consider that dreams are just figments of the imagination when the mind is temporarily divorced from controlling the body during the process of sleep. This is quite correct, but let us get down to this dream business. As we have discussed in previous lessons, we consist of at least two bodies. We are going to deal with two bodies only, the physical and the immediate astral, but of course there are many more bodies. When we go to sleep, our astral body gradually separates from the physical body and drifts up from the reclining physical. With the separation of the two bodies, the mind is indeed separated. In the physical body, there is all the mechanism in much the same way as one can have a broadcasting station. But when the announcer goes off, then there is no one left to send messages. The astral body, now floating above the physical, ruminates for some moments, deciding where to go and what to do. As soon as the decision has been reached, the astral body tilts feet foremost and settles down, usually at the end of the bed. Then, like a bird leaving a twig, the body gives a little leap upwards and is gone, soaring away at the end of the silver cord. Most people, in the West particularly, are not aware of the actual occurrences of their astral traveling. They are not aware of any particular incident. But when they return, they may have a warm feeling of friendship, or they may say, Oh, I dreamed of so-and-so last night. He did look so well. In all probability, the person actually did visit so-and-so or whoever it was, because such travel is one of the simplest and most frequently undertaken. For some peculiar reason, we always seem to gravitate to old haunts. We seem to like to go to places where we visited before, and in fact, the police have a statement to the effect that criminals always return to the scene of their crimes. There is nothing at all remarkable in us visiting friends because we all leave the physical body. We all do astral journeying, and we must go somewhere. Until one is educated to the subject, one does not roam in astral realms, but instead clings tenaciously to known places on the surface of the earth. 
People who have not been taught about astral traveling may visit friends overseas or a person with a very great desire to see some particular shop or location will go and see that shop or location. But upon their return to the flesh and to a weakness, they think, if they think at all, that they've had a dream. Do you know why you dream? We all have experiences which are excursions into reality. Our dreams are as real as a journey from England to New York by plane or ship, or from Aden to Accra by similar means, yet we term them dreams. Before delving further into the subject of dreams, let us remind one that since the convention of Constantinople in the year 60, when the leaders of the Christian Church decided what was to be embodied in Christianity, much of the teachings of the great masters have been distorted or suppressed. We could add some very pungent comments on all this from information which we have obtained from the Akashic Record, but our purpose in preparing this course is to help people to know themselves, not to tread on anyone's corns, no matter how fallacious those corns of belief may be. Let us content ourselves with stating that in the Western Hemisphere for several centuries past, people quite definitely have not been taught anything about astral traveling because it does not fall into any portion of organized religion. Incidentally, let us remind you that we say here organized religion. Again, in the Western Hemisphere, most people do not believe in fairies nor in nature spirits, and children who see fairies in nature spirits and who undoubtedly play with such entities are laughed at or scolded by adults who really should know better, for in this, as in many other cases, the child is far cleverer and far more awake than is the adult. Even the Christian Bible states that unless ye be as a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. We could state this differently and say, if you have the belief of a child uncontaminated by adult disbelief, you can go anywhere at any time. Children, being scoffed at, learn to disguise what they really see. Unfortunately, they soon lose the ability to see other entities because of this need of concealing their real abilities. It is much the same in the case of dreams. People have experiences when their physical body is asleep, for of course the astral body never sleeps. And when the latter returns to the former, there may be a conflict between the two. The astral knows the truth, and the physical is contaminated and clogged by preconceived notions inculcated from childhood up to adulthood. Through conditioning, adults will not face up to the truth, so there arises a conflict. The astral has been off and done things, experienced things, seen things, but the physical must not believe in this because the whole teaching of the Western people is to disbelieve anything that cannot be held in two hands and pulled to pieces to see how it works. Westerners want proof, more proof, and still more proof, and all the time they try to prove that the proof is wrong. Thus we have the conflict between the physical and the astral, and that leads to a need for rationalization. In this case, the dreams so-called are rationalized into some sort of experience, frequently with the weirdest results imaginable. Let us go into it again. 
We could have all sorts of unusual experiences when astral traveling. Our astral body would like us to wake up with a clear memory of all these experiences. But again, the physical body cannot permit it, so there's a conflict between the two bodies, and some truly amazingly distorted pictures come back into our memories, things which could not possibly happen. Whenever anything happens in the astral, which is contrary to the physical laws of the physical earth, there's conflict, and so fantasy sets in and we get nightmares or the most unusual happenings which one can imagine. In the astral state, one can levitate, float upwards, travel anywhere, see anyone, and visit any of the centers of the world. In the physical, it's not possible to move across the rooftop, and thus it is, we repeat, that in the conflict between the physical body and the astral body, there are such extremely distorted renderings of our astral traveling experiences, which really nullify any benefit which is trying to be sent down by the astral. We get so-called dreams which do not make sense to us. We dream all sorts of rubbish, or so we say, when we are in the physical. But the things which are rubbish in the physical are commonplace in the astral. Let us return to our original remarks about walking down the street without a stitch of clothing on. Quite a number of people have had this highly embarrassing experience, apparently in a dream, but of course, it is not a dream at all. It arises from the fact that when one goes astral traveling, one may forget all about wearing astral clothes. If a person does not imagine the necessary covering, then we have the spectacle of someone traveling in the astral completely nude. The natural body, we must remind you, is a body without clothing, for clothing is a purely man-made convention, which has no point in reality. We might digress here for a moment to tell you something else, which possibly will intrigue you. In the days of long ago, man and woman could see the astral of each other. Thoughts, then, were plain to all. One's motives were absolutely open, and we tell you again that the colors of the aura flare most vividly and most strongly around those areas which people now keep covered. Mankind, and especially womankind, keep certain areas covered because they do not want others to read their thoughts and their motives, which may not always be desirable. But this, as we said, is quite a digression and has little bearing on dreams. It's a point, though, which may cause you to ponder on clothing. When one is doing astral traveling, one usually imagines the type of clothing which one would normally wear in the daytime. If this imagining is omitted, a clairvoyant receiving an astral visitor may perceive the person and find that he or she has not a stitch of clothing on. We have had people call on us in the astral and they were wearing either nothing or perhaps a pajama jacket or some other quite out-of-this-world garment which defies description and possibly would not be found in any lingerie catalogue of the present day. It is a fact also that people who are overly clothes conscious will often imagine themselves, dream themselves, up clothing that they would not at all wear when in the physical body. But all this doesn't matter because we again state that clothing is merely a convention of humanity and we do not suppose that when we go to heaven we shall be wearing clothing such as there is upon this earth. 
Dreams, then, are a rationalization of actual living events which occur in the astral world, and as we have previously stated, when one is in the astral, one sees a far greater range of colors and with far, far greater clarity. Everything is brighter, everything is larger than life. One can see the most minute details. The colors are of a range far surpassing anything that can be upon this earth. Let us give an example here. We wandered out in our astral form far across the land and over the sea to a distant country. The day was brilliant with a vivid blue sky, and the sea beneath us had gentle white-topped waves flicking up at us, but of course not touching us. We sank down upon a golden sand and stopped to examine the wondrous diamond-like structure. Every point of sand glittered like gems in the sunlight. We moved along gently over waving fronds of seaweed. We were amazed at the delicate browns and greens and the air bladders which seemed to be turning golden pink. To our right was a rock of greenish tinge. It looked for a moment as if of the purest jade. We could see part way through the outer surface. We could see the veins of the striations, and we could see also some minute fossil-like creatures which had been embedded in the rock millions of years before. As we moved around, we looked about us with eyes that seemed to be new, with eyes that saw as never before. We could see what appeared to be transparent globes of color floating in the atmosphere, globes which were indeed the living force of the air. The colors were marvelous, intense, varying, and our acuity of vision was such that we could see as far away as the curvature of the earth would permit without causing us to lose any detail whatsoever. Upon this poor old earth of ours, while encased in flesh, we are comparatively blind. We have a limited range of colors and a poor perception of the shades of colors. We suffer from myopia, astigmatism, and other defects which make it impossible for us to see things as they really are. Here we are almost bereft of senses and perceptions. We are poor things indeed upon this earth, encased as we are in a sheath of clay, loaded down with lusts and grudges and clogged with the wrong type of food. But when we get out into the free world of the astral, we can see, see with the greatest clarity, see colors such as we never saw upon the earth itself. If you have a dream in which you see with startling clarity and in which you are delighted by the amazing array of colors, then you can know that you have not had an ordinary common dream but are rationalizing a genuine astral traveling experience. There is another matter which prevents many people from remembering their pleasures in the astral, and it is this. When one is in the astral, one is vibrating at a far, far higher rate than when one is encased in the body. It is an easy matter when leaving the body because the difference in vibration matters not at all when one is going out. The obstacles occur when we return to our body. And if we know what those obstacles are now, we can consciously dwell upon them and help astral and physical vehicles to reach some sort of arrangement. Let us imagine that we are in the astral. Our flesh body is below us. It's vibrating at a certain speed. 
ticking over almost, while the astral is a quiver with life, with vitality, for you are not bogged down with illness or with suffering in the astral. Perhaps it will help us if we put things in terms of the earth. Let's consider that we are dealing with the problems of a person in a bus. The bus is traveling at maybe 20 or 30 miles an hour, and the passenger urgently desires to leave the bus, which, unfortunately, cannot be stopped. So the problem is that the passenger has to jump off the bus in such a manner that he alights in the roadway without hurting himself in any way at all. If he is careless, he gets badly damaged, but if he knows how, it can be done easily, for one often sees bus personnel doing it. We have to learn by experience how to get off the bus when the vehicle is moving. We also have to learn how to get into the body when the speeds of the two vehicles are different. When we return from astral traveling experiences, our problem is to get into the body. Again, we are vibrating in the astral at a much higher rate than we are in the physical. And as we cannot slow down the one nor speed up the other more than a very, very limited amount, we have to wait until we can synchronize a harmonic between the two. With practice, we can do that. We can slightly speed up the physical body and slightly slow down the astral body so that while they are still at widely dissimilar vibrations, there is a fundamental harmonic, a compatibility of vibration between the two that enables us to get in safely. It's a matter of practice, instinctive racial memory practice. And when we can do that, we can get all our memories intact. Do you find this difficult to realize? Then let us imagine that your astral body is a phonograph pickup or a record player pickup. Your physical body is a phonograph record turning at what speed, shall we say, 48 RPM? Our problem is to put the needle onto the rotating record so that we hit upon one particular word or one particular musical note. If you think of the difficulties of putting this phonograph pickup in contact with the record so that the previously determined word or musical note is chosen, <clears throat> then you will appreciate how difficult it is, without practice, to come back from the astral with memories intact. If we are clumsy or unpracticed and we come back without being in synchronization, we awaken feeling thoroughly out of sorts. We feel cross with everything. We have migraine. Possibly we feel sick or bilious. That is because the two sets of vibration were united with a clash, just as one can get disharmony and a very definite clash if one changes gear in a car in a clumsy manner. If we come back at the wrong rate of vibration, we may find that the astral body does not fit exactly into the physical body. It may be tilted to one side or other, and the result is thoroughly depressing. If we are so unfortunate as to do this, the only cure is to go to sleep again, or rest as quietly as possible, not moving, not thinking, if one can manage it, keeping quite still and trying to get the astral body free from the physical once more. The astral body will drift up and lift a few feet above the physical body, and then, if we allow it, it will sink down and come back into the physical body in perfect alignment. We shall not feel sick or depressed anymore. It only takes practice and perhaps 10 minutes of your time. 
It is better to give this ten minutes and feel well than jump up all in a rush and feel that you would be happy to die on the spot because you cannot and will not feel better until you have been to sleep again and allowed your two vehicles to come completely into alignment. Sometimes one comes back to awareness in the morning with memories of a very peculiar dream indeed. Possibly it may be of some historical occurrences, or it may be quite literally something out of this world. In that case, it may well be that for some very specific reason connected with your training, you've been able to contact the Akashic Record. We shall deal with that in a later lesson, though. Perhaps you could see what happened in the past, or more rarely what will probably happen in the future. Great seers who make prophecies can often move the future and see probabilities, not actualities, for they have not happened, but probabilities can be known and foretold. You will see from this that the more one can cultivate a memory of what occurs in the astral, the more benefits one can derive, because there is no point in learning something with much toil and trouble if one is going to forget all about it within the next few minutes. It frequently happens that one awakens in the morning thoroughly bad-tempered, thoroughly hating the world and all that is within it, it takes one many, many hours to recover from this really black and gloomy mood. There are a number of reasons for this particular attitude. One is that in the astral state, one can do pleasant things, go to pleasant places, and see happy people. Normally one goes into the astral as a form of recreation for the astral body, while the physical body sleeps and recuperates. In the astral, one has a feeling of freedom, an utter lack of restriction or constriction. The feeling is truly wonderful. And then comes the call back into the flesh to start another day of what? Suffering? Hard work? Whatever it is, is usually unhappy. And so, having come back, having been torn away from the pleasures of the astral, one is truly unhappy and bad-tempered on awakening. Another reason, and not such a pleasant one, is that when we are on earth we are as children in a classroom, learning, or trying to learn, the lessons which we ourselves plan to learn before coming to the earth. When we go to sleep, it is so that the astral body can leave school and go home at the end of the day in just the same way as children return to their homes at the end of the day. Many times, though, a person who is self-satisfied and complacent upon the earth, thinking that he or she is a very important person, will go to sleep and then awaken in the morning in a thoroughly bad mood. This is usually because that person has seen in the astral that he is making a shocking mess of his life on the physical earth, that all the smugness and all the complacency is not really getting him anywhere. It does not at all follow that because a person has a load of money and acres of property that he's doing a good job. We come to earth to learn specific things, just as a person going to school or college learns to do specific things. It would be quite useless, to give you an example, for a college student to enroll for a course leading to a Doctor of Divinity degree and then for no explainable reason find that he was going to collect all the trash, all the garbage from some local town. 
Too many people will think that they are doing extraordinarily well because they are amassing money by swindling other people, by overcharging, by generally profiteering and giving bad deals. Those people who are class conscious or the nouveau riche as they are not really proving anything except that they are making a resounding failure of their life upon earth. There is a time when everyone has to face up to reality, and reality is not upon this earth, for this is the world of illusion, wherein all values are wrong, where for purposes of tuition one believes that money and temporal power and position are all that matters. Nothing could be further from the case than this, for the mendicant monks of India and elsewhere are of more spiritual value to the future life than the high-powered financier who lends out money at exorbitant interest to poor people who are hard-pressed and really suffering. These financiers, really they are called money lenders, really wreck the homes and the futures of those who are so unfortunate as to fall behind with one of the extortionate payments. Let one of these high-powered financiers and others of their ilk go to sleep and assume that for some particular reason they can get free from the flesh and get far enough to see what sort of a mess they are making. Then they come back with a perfectly shocking memory. They come back with an awareness of what they really are and with the determination that they will turn over a new leaf. Unfortunately, when they come back into the physical, being of a low type anyway, they cannot remember, and so they just say that they've had a disturbed night. They shout at their subordinates and generally bully everyone in sight, and so they give way to Monday morning blues. But sadly enough, they do not let this occur on Monday morning only, but almost every other day. Monday morning blues, yes, that really is the case, and for a special reason. Most people have to work fairly regularly, or at least put in the regular hours of work during so many days a week. At the end of the week, there's a period of relaxation, a change of vocation, and often a venue. People sleep more peacefully at the end of the week, and so the astral body goes out and travels further. It goes up to where perhaps it can see what sort of a job the physical is doing on earth, and then when it returns so that the physical body can start work on the Monday morning, there's generally much gloom, which is the cause of Monday morning blues. Yet another class of people should engage our attention, even if for a few moments only. Those who sleep little. These people are unfortunate enough to have so much on their astral conscience that the astral body is not at all willing to leave the physical and go out and face up to things. Often a drunkard will be afraid to fall asleep because of the quite interesting entities which gather around his emerging astral body. We have already dealt with pink elephants and other fauna and flora of that type. The physical, in such a case, will stay awake and be the cause of much suffering in the physical and on the astral. You have probably known people who are on edge all the time. They are on the move all the time. They are jittery and cannot rest for a moment. All too frequently, these people are those who have so much on their mind, on their conscience, 
that they just dare not rest in case they start to think and realize what they are and what they are doing and what they are undoing. So the habit starts. No sleep, no relaxation, nothing which gives the over-self an opportunity of really getting in touch with the physical. These people are like a horse which has taken the bit between its teeth and is bolting wildly down the road to the danger of all. If people cannot sleep, they cannot profit by a life on earth, and not profiting in this life, then they have to come again to do a better job next time. Do you wonder how to decide whether a dream is a figment of the imagination or is a distorted memory from an astral journey? The easiest way is to ask yourself, do you see things with greater clarity in that dream? If you do, then it is a memory of astral traveling. Were the colors more vivid than you can remember seeing them upon Earth? Then again, it is astral traveling. Often you will see the face of a loved one or have a strong impression of a loved one. That is because you may have visited that person by astral traveling. And if you go to sleep having in front of you a photograph of the loved one, then you can be sure that you're going to travel there when you close your eyes and let yourself relax. Let us take the other side of the coin. You may have awakened in the morning, ruffled and not a little angry, thinking of some particular person with whom you are definitely not in harmony. Perhaps you went to sleep thinking of that person, thinking of some dispute, some wrangle with which you and he were engaged. You may have visited him in the astral, and he, also in the astral, discussed with you a solution of the problems. You may have settled the matter. You may both have determined in your astral states that upon earth you would remember this solution and you would come back to an amicable agreement. Or, on the other hand, the battle may have been of even greater intensity, so that when you came back to the earth you had even greater antipathy towards each other than before. But no matter whether you had an amicable arrangement or not, if in coming back to the physical you had a bad jerk or did not synchronize yourself with your physical body, then all of your good intentions, all of your good arrangements would be shattered and distorted, and upon awakening your memory would be of disharmony, dislike, and bitter frustrated rage. Dreams, so called, are windows into another world. Cultivate your dreams. Examine them. When you go to sleep at night, decide that you're going to dream true. That is, decide that when you awaken in the morning, you will have a clear and uncontaminated memory of all that happened in the night. It can be done. It is done. It is. Only in the Western world, where there is so much doubt, so many shouts for proof are heard, that people find it difficult. Some people in the East go into trances, which, after all, is only one method of getting out of the physical. Others fall asleep, and when they awaken, they have the answer to the problems which perplex them. You can do this too. You too, with practice and with this sincere wish to do it only for good, can dream true and open wide that window into a most glorious phase of existence. End of Lesson 17